Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Other Record Labels, where we talk about the art and culture of running an indie record label. I'm your host, Scott Orr. Thank you so much for carving out a little bit of your day to, um, to you know, dive into the, the topic of indie record labels and, and running a record label or owning a record label or working for a record label or, um, or even just being a DIY artist. And I know we have a lot of indie artists who are not necessarily on a label, but are essentially doing the work of an indie label, but for themselves, uh, self-releasing their music. So thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope you find something helpful. Speaking of finding something helpful, we have put together a little bit of a free guide. You know this if you're a regular listener, but um, there have been hundreds, and I, I'm not exagger- exaggerating when I say that, but hundreds of people who have downloaded this and it's it's been so cool. And I hope you're finding it helpful. But basically we put together this free guide um, that summarizes a lot of the information and advice that we've received from our guests over the past couple of years on the show. And you can get this free guide by going to otherrecordlabels.com, sign up and get it. And I think you'll find it really helpful. There's also a link to a Facebook group, which is a private group. Um, and uh, a bunch of us now are, are kind of joining on there. If you are a label, uh, you just have to a- answer a question tell us where you heard about the group, et cetera, and what label you're affiliated with um, and join the group. And, and we're starting to build a little bit of a community there. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, speaking of pretty cool, I, I think we found the coolest indie label on the planet. Certainly um, a label that shows up in everyone's feed um, this past year. Um, and uh, I'm so excited today to talk with Seth from Polyvinyl Records. You know Polyvinyl. You especially know them from incredible artists like Of Montreal, American Football, Pedro the Lion, the Get Up Kids, and so many others. Um, it was such a cool experience to to chat with them today, and I'm so grateful they did the show. I know we have lots of fans of Polyvinyl, and I think they're, um, I probably talk about this, but I, I've been seeing some stuff about like a 30th or 20th or 25th. I don't know. You can correct me. Thanks for doing this, man. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for uh, the invite. It's it's cool. Like I, it's funny. I don't do a ton of these kind okay. of things. It's usually it's usually Matt who does the press stuff. But I uh, I love podcasts, so I was like, I want to do this one. <laughs> That's so, cool. And are you, uh, like, what's your title? Your your press or? No, marketing? I'm the label label director. Label director. Oh, right, right. Okay, cool. Okay, that's cool. How long have you been with the label? Since 2003. Oh, wow. Congrats. Yeah. That's a long time. <laughs> it's a very long time. 16 and, uh, years. And I was an intern in 2002 while I was in college. So At this label, at Polyvinyl? Yeah, at Polyvinyl. So, oh, when I, so when I started, um, it was in Matt and Darcy's basement, the owners of the label. And so, wow. yeah, did an, did an internship in the basement of their house. Um, ended up having to have like the internship coordinator from my school come to their basement to like <laughs> approve of the thing. Like it was like the end of the semester and they had to do a walkthrough and yeah. it was like kind of nerve wracking. Cause oh, I'm like, gosh. are they going to see this as like legitimate yeah, or not? They're not gonna give you the I'm credit. sitting in this basement <laughs> and like, am I going to get credit for this? I need to graduate. Um, but it all worked out. Oh, that's so. great. That's I, I want to think back now. I should keep a tally of how many people I've spoke to who, have started at a label as an intern. I know when we talked to Carly at Sub Pop, she dreamed of working for Sub Pop and she started as an intern and now she's like marketing director. And so it's just, I, I, but I've heard it maybe, well, definitely two times, but maybe, maybe a few more. And that's such a cool story. I feel like the internship is definitely a worthwhile way to go about getting your foot in the door. Um, a lot of our employees have actually been interns first and then kind of moved their way up to a paid position. Um, so, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the internship. Well, and I think it's, I agree with you. Uh, and if I was a lot younger, I would probably try to inf- intern for you guys. But if, uh, <laughs> if like, I imagine it's like a coveted role though, at some point for some labels that you start to get a lot of people asking and, and then there'd be a little bit more of a serious interview process to, to find the right intern. Is that, is that true? 
Well, I mean, we are in, you know, like our home office is in Champaign, Illinois, which is a big college town, okay. but it's not necessarily a huge indie rock town. Okay. So I think the amount of students that would love polyvinyl enough um, to want to intern, it's I never see. like an overwhelming amount just I because see. we, you know, while like I'm based in the San Francisco Bay Area and we have a couple guys in New York as well, but we haven't we don't really have interns there. So it's basically like our internship program is in Champaign. So it kind of reduces the overall yeah, okay. numbers. <laughs> then, yeah. I see uh -huh. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. But it's still good. I mean, we still get a, a great, great group every semester. So that's uh that's probably like good advice for anyone wanting to get into the music industry is don't move to New York <laughs> or, <laughs> or Portland, in Seattle, go instead, go to Champaign or go to some small town, wherever there's a label. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're, you know, between Merge, Secretly Canadian, Polyvinyl, Saddle Creek, a bunch of, you know, small college towns. Mm -hmm. it's yeah. It's affordable. There, there, have, <laughs> there have been a few times where I'm like working on the bio for an episode and, and like, or researching a label and finding out that they're in some small little tourist town, you know, off the beaten path. Yeah. That's, it's so cool. Yeah. It makes it uh, a lot easier when you're not having to pay rent right. of a major city. Um, right. And well, now it's all the same with the internet, but what was it like in the nineties or, or, you know, or even in the, when you came on in the early two thousands, the, the internet was still pretty, um, you know, pretty new. Um, uh, what was it totally. like for them in the, in the nineties to, to start off in such a small town? You know, I think, um, the way the label all came about, basically Matt and Darcy who founded it were super involved in like a DIY scene in a town called Danville, Illinois. Okay. And while they were in high school, they did a fanzine called polyvinyl press. Right. Okay. And, I heard that. That's cool. And and so then basically like as that was wrapping up, they decided to start releasing music and, you know, started the label in high school. And then it just kind of like continued to grow and they've never really done anything else. Um, it's like the, <laughs> the only thing. <laughs> and that so, was like what mid nineties. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so, um, and so yeah. it worked out to be in a small town that's not necessarily a music scene? Yeah, well, they had their own scene and like they would help put on DIY shows and all that kind I of see. stuff. And then, uh, lucky for me, they moved from Danville to Champaign, Illinois, um, right when I was needing an internship, which made it doable for me to actually go there. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so that that was the, the timeline. Um, uh, this is so great. We have so much to talk about and you have some really cool <laughs> stories with polyvinyls and I want to get to all of it. Um, this isn't a question, but I want to say that when, you know, I was going through everything and, and, um, that shy boys record was one of my favorite records from 2018. And I was just listening to it a bunch recently again, cause it's such a summary record. Yeah. That's awesome. That that's, that's a standout for you. That was that's a office favorite for sure. Yeah. And there's always one where we're like, how are more people not freaking out about I this know, band? I know, I <laughs> know. Um, well, I did a few tweets about it last year because I, I, you just, sometimes you get that feeling. It's like there, this record is not hitting as like enough people. You can just get a feeling that people aren't talking about it, but yet it's hitting you so hard, you know? Yeah, for sure. And like, I, it's like, it's funny. It's like one of those records that I put on with my oldest daughter in the car. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's like, it's become our record that we like listen to on the way to oh, preschool, nice. like most days. Nice. Um, and so like, you know, it's good for kids too, it but, is. uh, but yeah, yeah, it's, it's shit. Like their melodies are just so good. Yeah. And I think that they will find a bigger audience eventually, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, definitely one of those things where I'm like, I feel like I could put this on for just about anybody and they'll be like, man, this is really good. You know, like, yeah. I think it's, it's an easy sell if you can actually get people to press play. It's interesting. And I mean, it, it's interesting how like there are people who are maybe a little bit older who might be fans of classic songwriting of the 70s and the 60s, and they could definitely find a home yep. for it. But it's also like for younger people into indie rock, it just feels like a normal indie rock band. So it could really cross over a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they're also the sweetest people on the planet. So it's oh, cool. just like you just root for them to like, yeah. 
you know, blow up would be, would be awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, you know, looking, that was 2018. We're here at the end of 2019 ish. Um, and yeah. 2019 for, for polyvinyl, like long before we had booked this interview, right at the beginning of the year, it seemed like a special year, at least to me, like just as a, a, um, a bystander, like just kind of viewing and following you guys on social media, it seemed like the year started off with a few major home runs, like Pedro the lion, American football, get up kids. Uh, and, and like yep. things haven't slowed down. Does this year seem extra special for you guys as well? Yeah, it feels, it feels special for sure. And it's funny. Um, 2018, I think we felt like we put out too many records and kind of overextended <laughs> ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so then 2019 was supposed to be the, the reset where we tried to do fewer things right. and, and really focus in on the ones that we do. Um, I don't know how true that's actually been. I feel like we're still putting out a, a good amount of records. Maybe it's it's the overall number will be less, but then some of them are bigger records too, sure. which require more time. Um, but yeah, it does feel like it's been a special year, but at the same time, like I feel like I'm so in it all the time that I don't get a moment to step back and be like, whoa, this is a really big year. I, I kind of just have my head down most days and I'm just trying to like, yeah, you know, yeah, I see what keep you mean. Grinding. <laughs> no, I no, I see what you mean, and and um, I I think probably, and I'm curious how this is from your perspective. But when I was going through your discography, and you're scrolling and scrolling, and like you're still in 2019, and it's like <laughs> I I think it's because you have singles too. So like singles, yeah, take just as yeah. much effort. I think you know, and they get their own catalog ID and everything. Yeah, that's been a new thing too of like the standalone digital single has become a much more commonplace thing for us. Just right. as like in this era of streaming sure. music and um you don't find a lot of times it seems like you know bands used to make an album, promote the album, tour on the album, then go away and make another one and then come back. Yeah. And I feel like the mindset for most bands these days is to never really go away. Um it's kind of like, oh well, here's the album. And then here are some more songs and, you know, another tour and then maybe yeah. another video. And then, you know, and then here's another album and you just keep going. I'm not honestly sure which way was the better way, but yeah, no, um, I know what you mean. Um, but it is like, a, you know, the single thing is definitely like a newer development for us in like the last year or so of like bands wanting to just be like, I have this song. I just finished it and I want to put it out right now. And I don't want to wait for an album oh, I see. Okay. a year or two from now. And you guys um, are cool with that? For sure. I mean, yeah. I think, you know, at our heart, you know, like we're, we're always down to do what our artists want to do and try and like help them realize their vision for things. So we have always tried to be super adaptable at every turn so that, that we can, you know, you want to do a single? Great. You want to do a double album? Okay. You want to do a triple album li that's live? Okay. We can do that too. Like <laughs> we, you know, sometimes to a fault, we are uh, very artist friendly. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, the single thing, it's interesting because I, my perspective is I'm, I'm a fan of the albums. And so when a band that I like puts out a single, I might be, I maybe stream it for, 15 seconds, but then I just would rather wait for the record to come. And if they were to put out a standalone <laughs> single, it's really hard for me to, to put it into my listening patterns. You know, like I don't really okay. make like a monthly playlist. So, but at the same time, from a label standpoint, it sucks to release an album and have one song get its day in the sun and the other nine songs just kind of fade away and only be heard by the yeah. diehard fans, you know? Totally. Totally. Well, one thing, since you mentioned Shy Boys, they released two singles at the start of this year okay. that are both right. worth digging into. If you're a Shy Boys guy, right. yeah, I saw those that. two, yeah. the, try and try and fold those into your listening <laughs> habits. <Okay>. Um, <laughs> yeah. But but that's it. I totally know what you mean where, um, you know, like, oh, well, this single gets its moment in the sun and then everything else. And that's that's been something that's been on our mind throughout this, too, because um, like our band Generationals had uh -huh. this idea a few years ago to just start releasing digital singles with the idea that eventually they would all get compiled and released as a set. Right. Um, and it was really cool to watch because it, you know, the whole project lasted a couple of years 
But the cool thing was it gave each song on the collection a moment in the sun in that yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, which was cool because then it's like, okay, now we compile them all together and you can listen to it top to bottom. But each one had its moment where it was like, oh, well, this was the song that got on these playlists and like people really focused in on. And I thought that was a, a really cool approach. And I imagine it's hard if you're you're prom, uh, promoing a new upcoming record and you have to pick a single, and it's kind of similar to the radio days, but to pick a single <laughs> that will be playlist friendly, but at the same yeah. time you want it to be um, you want it to be friendly to to the you know the the diehard music fans and and you know take take the yellow bike for example that may be not be the best song or my favorite song on that record but it might be the best to reach people, to reconnect with people or to get on playlists. That's got to be a hard balance. Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like most of my time is spent working on timelines for releases and figuring out what the songs are going to be and what mm. date they're going to be on and all that. Yeah. There's a lot of strategy behind it all. And um, yeah, and sometimes you think you got it all right and then release day hits and Spotify picks whatever song they were feeling that didn't have anything to do with your plans. And then <laughs> right. that becomes the focus track for the record. So, right. Yeah. Um, that's true. Everything yeah. is different. You never, you never really know. Yeah, no, it's a good point. Yeah. And it's, and you never know how they pick that. Like, are they, are, are they smarter than you or was it completely random? <laughs> yeah. I think there is a dark art to the, to the whole thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, I will probably never figure it out. There was some sort of uh, like a consistent sound. And I mean, it was a little bit of a resurgence of that post-rock emo genre in the in the early releases of this year. And um, and it, and it's kind of a little bit of a, a sound of your label. Is that intentional? Um, it, you know, or it, and, and, and is I mean, thinking about older bands like Pedro and, and American Football and Get Up Kids. Is that something you guys want to be doing more of kind of? reconnecting with some of those older bands you know we have always tried to not have a sound mm -hmm. um but uh, you know like it's been an intentional part of our process as far as like bringing on new artists and trying to have it not just be like this is what a polyvinyl band sounds yeah. like and while you know while it's true we did put out a pedro the lion record a get up kids record an american football record all in the first four months of yeah. this year we also had like a Shushu record, a Julia Jacqueline record, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, we put out a Pale Hound album, you know, True. like, like, I feel like we try to find that balance. That's um, right. We would have intentionally put Pedro, American Football, and the Get Up Kids all right together, but it just was how it turned out with bands getting records done, and it, I see. it just, like, made the most sense for each individual project. Um but yeah, like I don't, I don't think that that will be kind of like the way things go moving forward of kind of bringing together older bands. Right, right, right. And like rehashing it is just like those specific projects spoke to us. So there's no, you know, obviously there's no Sunny Day Real Estate record coming. You know, I don't think so. Okay. Um, <laughs> you can break the news here if you want. <laughs> no, no, no. If I had it, I guess I would tell you. But, um, but yeah, I well, mean, I cool. think, yeah, for sure. Let's let me ask you about American football, um, and of course, that was a phenomenal record, such a beautiful record this year. Um, but let's, I want to go back to the beginning with them, and I mean, it, the story, and I and I'm kind of just picking up the pieces of the story really late in the game, but um, it's it to me, it would make like a great. HBO show or something, but is, <laughs> is it true their debut came out and it took longer for the acclaim to start rolling in? How did this all, yeah. all take place? Yeah. So it, it came out in kind of like a very small fashion. They, they played a handful of shows and it was basically like the end of college for, for those guys. They made a record and then okay. kind of went about their lives. And Mike Kinsella obviously went on and did Owen and mm -hmm. a million other bands too. But the other guys kind of just like got regular jobs and had families and, and kind of just moved on from it. And then just year in and year out, people just kept buying the record, kept telling their friends about it. And it just wow. kept kept growing and growing. And then it became kind of this mythical thing. <laughs> um, the band that no one ever saw when they were a band. And So did that um, help? Did it help that they were broken up in a way? 
I I think it probably like added to the mystique of it. Right, right. And then um yeah, the the random part was like I guess this was five or six years ago now. Um Steve Holmes from the band wrote us and just said, Hey, I was cleaning out my house and I found this box of cassette tapes of old recordings of American football. Do you guys have any use for these? And so they sent them to us and then we went through them all, got them all digitized and cleaned up and then realized like, Hey, there's a bunch of really cool stuff on here that I'm sure fans would die to have. Um, what if we make some sort of a deluxe version of the first record with all this new stuff as like a second um, LP. Mm. And then, and it really just kind of, that's what started the whole resurgence of that band as far as like, that's what led into them deciding to play shows and reuniting and then, you know, making the follow-up record and then now making a third record too. Um, so, it's really been a, a wild ride and like, I can't think of another band that's had a similar history. Sure. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Now was the, okay. So you're talking about this, the, the remaster and everything, the re-release re happened, in, um, you know, five or six years ago, you're saying, but what in that time between when the first record came out, you know, approximately, I don't know, 10 years or so was the, as the record was receiving this cult status, was the label disappointed that there was no plans for a follow-up? No, no. I mean, like, you know, this was in like the early days of the label where like it was never, it was never like, Oh man, we're, we're losing so much money on American football. I think it was like <laughs> such a inexpensive record to put out. Cause it was, at the time, Matt and Darcy's friends that wanted them to put out the record. And then it it just kept growing year in and year out. So it was like, I don't think the idea of American football reuniting was even a thing that we thought was possible for a really long time. Sure. Um, just, you know, everyone had kind of moved on and, you know, Mike has had plenty of other projects to focus on instead. Yeah. Uh, so, so after the reissue jump to 2016, and I'm trying to remember this a, a little bit, and a lot of it is just kind of what I'm reading, but you're, you're prepping to announce the release of their second LP. That must've been like a exciting and stressful time sitting on information, <laughs> working on that campaign. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, you know, it was a, it was a pretty wild time. Like I do feel like maybe we, got so caught up in the excitement of the reunion that we like rushed the, you know, proper follow-up record out into the world a little bit, because okay. I don't know if you saw this, but basically like there was an Owen album that Mike released in the summer of the same year. And so mm -hmm. it was like, he had a record. And then like a few months later, it's like, boom, here's an American football record. And it's like, well, Oh, I see. Maybe we should have maybe we should have spaced those out a little yeah, bit. Right. But, right. <laughs> but at the same time, like I think the excitement was just, you know, so big at that point that it was like, let's just run with this because it's totally insane how much people are clamoring for a follow-up record now that it's like people have finally gotten to see the band live and it's like, you know, like so let's I, let's do this. So I don't remember that that time, but what was it a surprise release? Uh, it was not a surprise release. We ended up um, releasing a few singles. Okay. It was a shortened timeline. Like we I think it was under two months, maybe oh, from wow. like the day we announced it to the day it came out. And had there been any um, rumors or social, like any uh, leaks of them in the studio at all? No, no, no. Um, okay. It was all pretty hush hush. And so like we, you know, we did a few teasing video things like in the days leading up to our announce, but at no yeah. point was it really like, leaked in that way where it's like oh they're in the studio they're making this record like we we kind of wanted to keep it under wraps because like the other thing too was just like just in case it never actually materializes we didn't want to like <laughs> yeah, get like, people's hopes up right so like right. we kind of just you know stayed quiet until we were sure that we had the thing yeah that must be kind of fun from a campaign standpoint too because i mean the story is just writes itself you know yeah, yeah for sure the it's funny you know that was a surprise and then like just over the last year and a half we've had the vivian girls reunite and and oh, like right. their new record is next month and 
they basically had to rehearse and write in private for like an entire year <laughs> wow. and then, you know, and like make the record in private and like not let anybody know. And it was like, but that one, somehow we were able to make it until we announced it before anyone realized that they had kind of gotten back and were doing stuff. Oh, um, wow. which is, which is exciting. It's like a, it's fun to be in on the secret in that way. And also terrifying that I'm going to be the one to blow it. But, uh. <laughs> well, there's so much, there's so much uh, excitement around that type of thing. And I think everyone has gathered around Reddit and Twitter to talk about these bands. And so when people drop little, you know, five second uh, videos or, or they, or they do like a blurry screenshot of a, a Dropbox account, I just love that kind of stuff. I think everyone just eats that up. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's it's easy to do stuff like that just to engage with your fans and build excitement for whatever you're working on. I want to ask you about the the Pedro relationship because I remember, and I don't know when this was now, I remember if it was last year sometime that there was this big announcement that they were coming back together, that David was putting this, getting the band back together and going under this name again and and potentially making a new record. And then I think, and you can remind me, there was like a a individual press release that they had signed to polyvinyl. And I, th I think that was a big deal that they were getting back together. And there was probably a lot of labels that would have gladly taken them. How did they end up on, on polyvinyl? Yeah. So, um, we've known Dave for a really long time now. His okay. manager is actually based in Champaign, Illinois, oh, okay. um, where the labels founded. So we've known Bob who manages him for a really long time. And I tried like when Pedro the lion was ending, Originally, I went really hard to try and do Dave's solo records. Oh, okay. um, just because I've always been such a huge fan of that guy and sure. w wanted to to work with him. And then ultimately, they did everything with Barsook, and you know, and then when it kind of came back around again, I think they always knew there was a standing offer from Polyvinyl if they ever did, wanted to to get involved. And mm. so, um, I think there was just like a moment where like Bob let it be known that Pedro was reforming and, you know, we went pretty hard for it as soon as we knew that and it, it worked out. Yeah, that's great. Well, it definitely made a lot of sense and it seems like a good fit. I felt like, I, I remember when that record came out in, in January and I was over at a buddy's place and we were listening to it and I remember kind of thinking that it felt like a good time and, and I, I felt like it was the right time for a Pedro. I don't know if there just seemed to be a lot of nostalgia happening with, with, you know, that generation, like Dave's generation. And, um, and, and there's a lot of that 90s sound and late 90s sound that's coming back. It just, it felt like the right time. I'm not sure if it would have struck a chord as well, if it had been released five or 10 years earlier, you know, or. Yeah. Like if they hadn't gone away and like, that was just like the next record that got made. Like, yeah, yeah I, I, yeah. Or I even, agree with that. Yeah. Or even just two or three years earlier, it just feels like now is, was <laughs> yeah. the right time. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with that. Like, I feel like it, you know, just happened to be the right moment for that to have happened. Um, not that it was an intentional thing of like, you know, kind of like a, a plan to be like, Oh, well, this is big right now. Let's reform this band and take advantage of it. I think yeah. it's just like a, na a natural thing that happened and, <laughs> and like just happened to be the, the timing worked. Yeah. Yeah. I, there's gotta be a lot of pressure to pull off something like that. I mean, to, to live up to the fans expectations. I mean, I'm, people were going nuts when they announced that they were working on a new record and coming back, but you all, you want to respect their legacy. Like how does that, how does that work? And, and, uh, how do you pull that off? Uh, wait, say that again. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. I'm just, I'm no, it's okay. That was a, a crazy long question. I, I'm just thinking <laughs> when, when a band like Pedro announces that they're coming out with a new record, there's this pressure on you and the label to live up to the fans expectations and to respect their legacy. I just imagine there's gotta be a lot of pressure, uh, in putting that release together. Yeah. I mean, I would say that the pressure isn't really on us, you know, okay. like I think I would think that, you know, in my mind, it's like, Oh, well it's on Dave. Cause he's the one that's writing the songs and recording them and going through that whole process. Like by comparison, like what we have to do is easy. Um, so, yeah. so like, and the other thing too, that I like the, the idea that it, when we were starting to work with the band, it was, 
not just one album, but a five album series. Mm. Um, and so like they had this whole vision for it where it's like, I'm going to write a, uh, an album about one town I grew up in, you know, and I'm going to make five of them for like basically my entire huh. youth. Um, and so that's why Phoenix is first. Um, and so, yeah, so like basically there are four more records coming from Dave. Wow. Um, and that's, yeah. I didn't so it's that. like a, it's a, well, that's the other part is we, we didn't want to lead with that um, just because it puts the pressure on to be like, you don't want, I guess you don't want to do the Sufjan Stevens yeah. thing of like, we're <laughs> going to do 50 states and then peace out <laughs> after two. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think, you know, we tried to like not lead with it being a five album thing, but I think Dave's so excited by the project that he's just like in interviews and even on stage, he just kind of spills the beans and just yeah. like the excitement of like the project wins out and he, you know, that's we'll great. tell his fans what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, he's always been really prolific, even if it's not under Pedro the Lion. He's always been very prolific. Yeah, for sure. For That's sure. awesome. Um, the the amount of like pivotal albums and records that have ended up on year end lists from you guys is pretty incredible. Like, do you have some <laughs> sort of secret A and R formula that you can share with our listeners? Oh, uh, no, uh, not really. No, but um, I mean, it's true. I mean, there's some really huge acts over the past few years that, um, well, or decades really that, um, you just seem to, to be able to cut through the noise better than most. Well, it's funny because, uh, you know, when we look at ourselves, sometimes we're like, man, like XYZ label has it figured out. Like they're on more <laughs> year lists than us. Like what do, what do we need to do to get up on their level? Right. Uh, so it's, so it's nice that there's someone else out there being like, Whoa, look at polyvinyl. Who's like got all these critical things. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, that's... it's good to hear that stuff sometimes so that right. you don't like, you know, go too negative ever. But I mean, I think the only thing I can really say about our A&R stuff is that it's always been being a fan first and yeah, leading with that right. and making sure that the people who decide like, okay, you know, what bands are we working with? It's like, if we're a fan of the band is like step one. So if we get to that point, like that's huge for us. And like, maybe we've missed out on some huge bands over the, over the years by, you know, missing a trend or something like that. And like, mm -hmm. Oh, well, we could have sold a bunch of records if we would have, you know, really gotten into this and instead it's just like, well, maybe so, but we've just been true to ourselves and always made sure that like, we believe in the thing that we're putting out into the world. And so that's more or less how we've gotten to this point. You look at a band like, you know, American football or Pedro and, and, and these guys have, have been around for such a long time and their fan base is so huge. But then we were talking, when you were talking about shy boys, you yeah. kind of were talking about them in the future sense that that they're growing and uh, and that more people will come on. Um, how do you like? What is your your um, commitment level from the beginning with the band? I mean, is it is it this kind of thing where you commit to a, a long time to develop a, a band? Yeah, I mean, we try to have long standing relationships with our artists, and you know try to view ourselves as the forever home of the band right? so that there's yeah. so that like they can grow within our system and, you know, from the baby band to the biggest band and like, you know, the bands at the very top end, like we can grow with them and not have it be a situation where like we're holding them back in some way. And so like, right. so far it seems like that's kind of been the, the way it's all worked where like we can do the job that's needed on any level. I, I, it's funny you mentioned that actually, because as I was looking through, I was like, I was like, oh, these guys are on this label, and then I'm like, I wonder who who they started on. Like, where did they? What was their first label? And then it's like, oh, it was still Polyvinyl. And like, you know, in this day and age, it's really common for a, a self release to turn into like a small indie label, then to go up to a bigger label like Polyvinyl or Capture Tracks or something, and then to maybe you know go get even bigger. But I think that's really totally. cool to keep everybody in the family. Yeah, for sure. That's always been, um, like the goal with this. And obviously some people have left and like, you know, we, we recently had our first band jump to a major and it was just like, man, it took 
over 20 years for a band to finally jump from polyvinyl to a major label. And it was like, that's wow. pretty crazy that that could happen. That it took that long for that to really happen. Wow. Um, Who was that? That was white reaper. Oh, okay. okay. Um, so, cool. so yeah. And yeah, <laughs> that's great. No, I mean, I did, it's kind of interesting. And I think just thinking about shy boys and there's just these bands that, you are so passionate about as a fan and you want so many more people to hear. So it's good to hear that their label is, is in it for the long haul because it's just a shame whenever you have this great record that you love so much. And then five years later, you find out that they're an accountant, you know, or they've gone out of the business. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's definitely how, like we, we view things in like a a bigger picture whenever possible, just to be like, let's keep growing this thing and, and be there to support them. Um, and that's also why like we take on a lot of like newer bands too. So it's not all the like, you know, Pedro the lion, American football kind of thing. It's like, let's put out some first records by people or first song by people or, you know, that kind of stuff. Like we, we try to do all of those things. I rem- I just read something. Speaking of this, I just read something that Polyvinyl is working closely with Double Double Whammy. We've had them on the show before. How did that come about? And what does that look like f- for those guys and for you guys? It's funny. I listened to Mike's episode last night just oh, cool. to prep, just to <laughs> prep for this to make sure. I'm like, okay, I need to make sure I really understand what oh, I'm nice. I'm walking into here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so that has been a new chapter for Polyvinyl where. Um, basically we have wanted to expand what we do and like help more people. And it became that the double dumb whammy was this really cool label that had, you know, big, big vision for, for everything. And it, you know, after talking with them for a long time, it, it seemed like polyvinyl getting involved could help grow the label. And um, yeah, so we, we became partners and, you know, Mike runs everything and just kind of like comes to us for guidance on, on stuff whenever possible. Yeah. And that's um, great. They are a great label. And I, and I think I remember when I was talking with Mike, like, I don't know if it was right after that, like he went out on a pretty big tour and then he did a solo record. So I imagine he could probably mm-hmm. use some help. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he now has one other person working at the label and like, I think the two of them even struggle to keep up just because of, you know, he's had some great luck with, with A&R of, of having some records blow up and, yeah. um, he's got a lot to keep up with for sure. Yeah. But, well, but yeah, really like cool. I think what he's, yeah, I, I for see sure. The, I see the similarities between the two labels for sure. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, and, and more than that, I feel like the way he approaches doing things is very much the way we have. And so like, you know, it definitely feels like kindred spirits in that way where it's like, okay, we have the same you know, feeling about how this should go and how to be artist friendly and, you know, how to go about this business. And so that's, that's been the coolest part of just, you know, helping them along in that way. Mm. So thinking, talking, talking about you and and going back to 2003, I mean, over the, over the past 16 years, uh, and I, I try to ask this a lot with, with labels that have been around for a while, things have changed so much. And I mean, and no, totally. They, they feel like they level out for about five years and then a huge flip. Like, how do you manage that? I mean, how do you <laughs> like, uh, have you, have you, do you have thicker skin now? Uh, sure. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that the way we've always tried to be is to still be small enough to adapt to the way things are constantly changing. Mm. Um, and I think that's been the reason we've been able to survive all these years is just because we don't get set in our ways and say like, this is how an album has to come out. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, and we've tried some like some crazy stuff over the years, you know, like you name it. I, you know, like, I feel like we've, we've given it a shot. Um, (laughs) did you ever do those, uh, USB remember when people were releasing records on USB sticks? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, for sure. For sure. A couple Um, hours. I don't know if we actually did a USB stick, but the craziest one for us was the of Montreal album skeletal lamping was like a crazy one where basically it was an entire line of products and all of them came with a download. I mean, this is back in the era when people downloaded music still, but it was like, it was like the crazy thing where it's like, 
do you want the t-shirt the album as a t-shirt or a button oh, set no. or like yeah. wall clings or a giant horse poster you know like right, there was right. all this crazy shit and it was That's um funny. at the time it was just like no one was doing anything like that and it was this crazy thing to be like okay i guess we're gonna have to figure out how to manufacture all this stuff that <laughs> we've never done before and then navigate getting like downloads to count you know with yeah. a t-shirt sale and like all this yeah, kind of stuff that yeah. like now has become so commonplace but yeah, well, way like, back then it was like revolutionary in a way right that was uh 10 years before arcade fire would sell fidget spinners yeah <laughs> <laughs> for sure how do you feel about things? Time. How do you th- feel about things now? Are you still trying to figure things out? Is it still new discovery for you, or do you feel a little bit more comfortable? Um, I mean, I feel like we're always learning and trying to improve. I don't think that will ever stop. Mm. Um, I think that the modern era of music gets a bad rap as far as like, oh my god, the sky's falling. This is yeah, this right, isn't right. going to work out. But like, I think that if you you like are smart about what you're doing and you're paying attention, there's a way to thrive in this current environment Mm -hmm. as an artist and as a, as a label. Um, I think that there's a way to do it that, you know, can build a career for an artist and have them, you know, live off of their art. I think it's all still possible. Yeah. So you, you feel hopeful, you know, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I think just the scale at which the streaming thing could develop um, is like a very powerful thing and could really change things. Um, But I guess change them more than they already have been changed. You think it can get better? I do. I mean, I just think so many more people will, you know, join, you know, Apple music or Spotify and like, I think that will just continue to be more and more of a thing that like just kind of is part of being a person in this world of like everyone has a smartphone and then on that smartphone, you listen to music and the service that you do is, you know, whatever. So then it's like, well, if we got that, you know, if the audience is way bigger then like, it's okay that we're getting fractions of a penny per, per play. That's right. Yeah, no, I get that. Well, I'm here in Canada and I wouldn't be surprised if one day the government just starts paying for it, just becomes a socialist thing or everybody has has a membership. Well, you guys already have the grant system, which is, which is awesome. Oh yeah. Um, That's, oh yeah. It's great. The times we've, we've worked with Canadian bands. I'm just like, wow, (laughs) that's crazy. Or like talk, or talking to Canadian labels. I'm like, wow, you guys just get money to be a label. To Um, make a music video. Yeah. Yeah, make a music video or just run your label just so that, you know, you're providing like a cultural um, contribution. Yeah, Yeah. I think (laughs) to Canada and the world. So it's like, here's money to go do that. I I don't think that's ever going to happen for us. Yeah. So the the question about the streaming, I mean, it's kind of interesting because you can uh, uh, like an uh, independent artist can release something and not get picked up by spotify editorial and not picked up by even a third party and it could just completely fall on dead ears but then on the other end so that's sad on the other hand i was looking at this um pianist who just writes these instrumental tunes and he has been on he's you know not a household name nobody would know who he is and he's been picked up on a lot of these like relaxing playlists and study playlists yeah. and he's probably yeah. making a career. And so here's a classical pianist who's making a living. He's got a million listeners. And I think that's a beautiful thing. So, I mean, it's, I agree, you know, two sides. I, of the I coin. would agree. There, there are, I mean, not to say that, that it's all perfect. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot to still get fixed, but I do think that as a concept, it's like, like, I don't think streaming is going to go away. I don't think you're going to, you know, put the toothpaste back in the tube. Sure. Um, yeah, no, that's right. But I, but I think it can be a very powerful thing for artists and I think it can continue to be better for them as well. Um, I also think, you know, things like Bandcamp are such a huge thing for bands and like, it's such a powerful mm-hmm. tool that, that all bands have access to. Like, I feel like, the ability to find a platform and, and release your music is, is like, you know, 
at an all-time high right now. Yeah, no, that's true. Uh, have you with with Spotify? Is it different for for indie rock and for you know maybe genres that aren't don't have like a common uh, uh, playlist that that they would fall into when when you're pitching to to Spotify? Yeah, I mean, I think that. <laughs> I don't know how much, you know, a Spotify really cares about indie rock. Um, okay. I think there's, I think there's definitely that. I mean, they have playlists for it, but I definitely think that there's a ceiling for, for that. Yeah. Um, I it think it feels that way. It, it doesn't seem to be a huge priority at just as a genre for them. Mm. Um, and I get, it. I know a lot, a lot of people don't listen to indie rock. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's, there's definitely some, you know, sought after playlists that I feel like, every band and label under the sun kind of like pitches for when they have new stuff. Yeah. And, and yeah, and those are, are really powerful. Um, you know, when you get on those. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, you know what, this has been so much fun. It's been so great to talk to you. I really appreciate you doing this. I, um, I interviewed, uh, Kevin from top shelf a couple of weeks ago. Oh, awesome. And cool. he told me that, um, I guess I don't, I can't remember. I should have listened to it before this, but like maybe 10 years ago, he emailed when he, when they were just starting out, maybe it's more than 10 years ago. I can't remember now when they were just starting out, they emailed a bunch of labels for, uh, support and for advice. And he said that polyvinyl was the only one that got back to him. Yeah. And that uh, credit is due to Matt, who is the owner of, of polyvinyl. Okay. Like he, he had, you know, develop their relationship. Not that we're not all friends with the top shelf crew, but, sure. but I think they had a connection with Matt, um, from the early days. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like, I think we're always, you know, we always want to just be a resource and to try and help, you know, like I don't, I don't really like the idea of the, well, not to say I'm not competitive, but I don't think that another label success is somehow like our failure or Absolutely. anything like that. I think that we can all find success in our own way and we're a community and I don't really want to ever like not nurture that. Like we're all in this together. Like, mm -hmm. like let's, let's help each other. Um, and I don't think that that would ever change for us. I, I wonder, I mean, there's, I, I've been talking with a lot of our listeners and, and learning about them and the labels that they run. And there's a lot of like indie rock and a lot of, DIY tape labels that are listening in. Do you have advice for, for these um, people who are starting a label, you know, right now or in the midst of, of year one or year two or year three of, of running a indie rock label? Oh man, what a, what a tough question. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I, I do think that if you have the passion for this, like you can find your way, um, mm. just be ready to, to work hard. And, and that's always been the way I've approached anything I care about in my life of just like, you know, I'm willing to outwork everyone else uh, mm. to try and get ahead. And I think that that's, that served me well. And I think it would serve anyone else well, but definitely, you know, follow your passion, put out things that you truly believe in and, you know, hopefully everything works out. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that is great advice. And I know it sounds simple, but that's true that working hard, I remember I read in a book one time that it was like, you know, you could be at a party standing in a room and you, you can't control if you're the best looking, you can't control if you're the smartest, but you can control if you're the hardest working. And I, I, that really stuck with me just to be like, I can work really, really hard. And when it's hard to get up early in the morning or to dedicate time on weekends or whatever, um, I can do this. And, uh, yeah, that's great advice, man. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for doing this, Seth. It's been a lot of fun to talk to you and such an honor to talk with Polyvinyl. Yeah, I mean, thanks for including us. Thank you for listening and thanks to Seth Hubbard for from Polyvinyl for taking the time to do the show. Um, we have so many more great episodes coming up and so much more involved with the podcast and I thank you so much for listening. I thank you for being a part of the, the community. I thank you for downloading the free guide that we, we've got up on otherrecordlabels.com and enjoying the Facebook group. Thank you so much for all this. Make sure you go to polyvinylrecords.com to check them out. Um, and, and you can really 
today you can go to your record store and buy a record for them because I'm sure every indie store has a polyvinyl record in it. And, you know, we talk about that Shy Boys record. Don't sleep on that record. It's one of my favorites. Um, and maybe that would be a good one to pick up today. Thanks so much for listening.